Thanks to everybody for, for being here and celebrating these businesses that we're launching through e for all Cape Cod. Uh, so welcome. I'm Kristen Marshall. I'm the executive director of e for all Cape Cod. And I am Amanda Kaiser. I'm the program manager for e for all Cape Cod. And just a heads up that this event will be recorded on Zoom. And so thank you to the sponsors that make this possible. Uh, so one of the great things about e for all is that it's exactly zero dollars for entrepreneurs um, to take advantage of this and to launch businesses and, and to grow our local economy. And uh, so we have these sponsors to thank. So Mass Growth Capital Corporation, uh, the Rockland Trust uh, Charitable Foundation, and Cape Cod Five, and of course, donors like yourselves. So Amanda, you wanna take this one? So the Accelerator Program is something that we offer twice a year. It is free to the entrepreneurs to, to participate in. And it's basically like a business 101 boot camp. So for the three first three months, they are in what is known as the intensive period. They're just emerging from that. They've been attending classes twice a week for the last 12 weeks. And this is their capstone project where they're going to describe everything that they've been working on and everything that they are working towards with their new businesses. Um, as a result of these final presentations, we will be celebrating their graduation on Thursday, January 7th. And we'll be awarding some seed money in part based on evaluations from the judges from the presentations that happened last night are happening tonight and again tomorrow night. Thanks, Amanda. And so what we'll see tonight are three entrepreneurs doing their final presentation. So each entrepreneur has 10 minutes to hit several criteria. And then we'll have 10 minutes of uh, questions and answers from the judges. And then we have a few five minute commercial breaks. Um, and two of those commercial breaks we're gonna use for alumni updates. So folks who have been through the E4L Accelerator program in the past. And you may um, periodically hear me butting in here. I am the official timekeeper. So I'll be letting these folks know when they're halfway through their time period. And you may also hear me at the end if they run up against their, uh, their time. Nice. And the alumni updates that we are excited for tonight. Our first gonna be Melissa Jankowski. She was in our fall 2019 cohort, so just a year ago. And uh, since then she's opened the Buttercup Cafe on 6A in Barnstable. So we're gonna to get to hear from her on how that's going. And uh, the alumni update number two is two falls ago. So fall 2018, the first group, Allison Leparati. Um, and she is launching a movie production company and uh, this is her in front of the 30 foot green screen that they just built. So Amanda, if you'll take that. And we just wanna say congratulations to all of the entrepreneurs who have made it thus far. Um, we have four who presented last night. We have three more that are presenting uh, tonight and then the balance will be presenting tomorrow night. And of course, each of these entrepreneurs has also been teamed up with uh, three mentors who have been their lifelines and their sanity check over the last 12 weeks as well. So congratulations to everyone, both the entrepreneurs and the mentors who've made it to this point. So presenting tonight, uh, first up, this is the order in which we'll see folks. So it's gonna be Caroline Lay of Atlantic Soap Company, uh, Minxer Taiki Magyar of Big Tree, and um, his name isn't actually Petal P-Town. It's Rick Alberg uh, from Petal P-Town. Sorry, Rick. Um, so we do wanna see some audience participation tonight, um, but we do ask that you hold the chat feature until commercial breaks, um, because it can be a little bit distracting if you see the chat bubble popping up as people are either presenting or, or doing their Q&As. And we would ask that you mute, uh, if you're an audience member, that you do mute during um, the speakers and the Q&A. And uh, we also invite you to celebrate. Um, so when a presentation is done, we'd ask that you unmute your, your phone or your computer and let's cheer and make some noise. All right, so let's kick it off with some judges intros. Amanda, can you introduce, kick us off with Spira? 
Sure. So Spiro Mitrakostas is a licensed agent and registered representative with New York Life Insurance and New York Life Securities. Working with small business owners, he helps them turn their equity into pensions. He is the former executive director of the Dennis Chamber of Commerce and the Cape Cod Technology Council. Spiro grew up on Cape Cod with experience in the hospitality industry, commercial real estate, and public sector economic development. He has served on many commissions and nonprofit. Thank you for being with us tonight again as a judge. Let's hear it for Spiro. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks Spiro. Yay. Next up for our judges, again, a returning judge, Bob. Thanks for coming again tonight. Um, Bob is retired after 40 plus years in the clinical and research laboratory business. During his career, he gained extensive cross-functional experience in sales, marketing, customer, and technical support, and general management. Most recently, Bob owned and operated his own company that supplied robotic tools to isolate nucleic acids from various tissue types. His clients were biobanks, university medical centers, clinical laboratories, cancer centers, biotech, and pharmaceutical companies. Although much smaller than its large corporate competitors, Autogen achieved success by putting the customer in their needs first, with the understanding that we would do whatever it took to satisfy their requirements. So during his career, Bob enjoyed extensive worldwide travel and learned how to succeed in business across many different cultures. He now enjoys spending time with his family, especially his first grandchild, and playing lots of golf. Uh, help me welcome Bob. Thank you. <laughs> Bob, yay, Bob. <laughs> Woo. Next up, we have uh, David Wiseman. David has a 35-year 35 35-year 35 career in talent development and innovation. David was the Senior Director of Learning and Talent Development at Foundation Medicine, where he was a member of the HR leadership team that guided the company from 650 to 1,500 employees in two years and to a Boston Business Journal 2020 Best Places to Work Award. He was also an adjunct professor of marketing for MBA and undergraduate students at Bentley University. As Vice President of Self-Service Banking at Fleet Bank and Vice President of Research and Development at Bay Bank, David oversaw innovations like next generation ATMs, online banking, and smart cards. David has also launched a number of entrepreneurial endeavors, including founding KidBite, a computing, computer learning center for children, being part of the launch team for Bergen Business Networks, a peer-to-peer -peer networking and research firm focused on healthcare, and owning two Curves for Women franchises. Thank you and welcome to David for tonight. Welcome, David. And then returning judge, Asia Atwood. So Asia, Asia, oh, Asia, sorry, Asia. Asia is an entrepreneur, team leader, and cannabis advocate with over 15 years of experience in the engineering industry. She's a mechanical engineer by education and graduated, graduated cum laude from Northeastern University. She cut her teeth professionally as an engineering consultant and specialist working in natural catastrophe risk engineering. And by 2011, started her first entrepreneurial business. Now Asia applies her experience in climate disaster risk engineering to create innovative technologies that will revolutionize urban farming in order to protect our food and plant medicine supply. Asia currently serves as the CEO of Trella Technologies and is the president of Climate Disaster Consulting LLC. Um, so you can learn more about her at asiaatwood.com. Thanks, Asia. Welcome, Asia. Ooh, welcome. Yay. I think you guys need to practice more on this unmuting and making noise thing. <laughs> like we're gonna, ha yeah, you're gonna have to up your game here, people. A little more, a little <laughs> more noise. Um, last but not least, tonight with our judges, we have Susan Penta. Susan is an engineer, entrepreneur, educator, and consultant. She is founder and managing partner at the Dior, where she oversees the delivery of professional services and is uniquely able to inspire innovative thinking, facilitate a common product and technology vision optimize organization output, and improve financial performance for her clients. As an educator, Susan served for 18 years as an executive professor on the adjunct facility at Northeastern University, where she taught graduate courses in entrepreneurship and innovation. Susan is a frequent author and speaker on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship, and product organizations. She has started multiple companies, holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from 
Worcester Polytech Institute and an MBA from the Cass Business School in London, England. When not supporting her clients, a mentee, or one of her favorite nonprofits, Susan can be found outside in an exercise class or in her kitchen, testing and optimizing recipes. Susan is married with two daughters in their mid-20s and splits her time between Belmont and Katuit. Please help me welcome Susan tonight. Yay. Okay, slight improvement, slight improvement. I like it. <laughs> Excellent. So let's hear some final presentations. I'm going to stop sharing here. And just so folks know, uh, the entrepreneurs wanted to kind of drive the presentation. So we've given them hosting privileges and they're just going to share their screens and, and go through the presentations. And once the 10 minutes are up, they're going to leave the presentation up during Q&A so that they can kind of go through the slides. Um, so first up, Caroline, let's let's kick it off. All right. Hey, Caroline. <laughs> uh, hold on one sec. Let me go back to the beginning here. Whoops. Hold on. Okay. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline Lay. I'm the owner of Atlantic Soap Company based in West Falmouth. Uh, I've been in business since June 2000, 2019, uh, creating small batch handcrafted bar soaps made using seawater sourced locally right off of the shores of Cape Cod, as well as hand poured soy candles and lotion bars. Um, so a lot of people ask me why soap? Um, how did you start making soap? And it's a good question. Uh, I have a degree in art history. So for a long time, I've been really interested in the creative arts um, and appreciating the creative arts, but I always felt like artists were other people and not me. <laughs> I have a lot of very creative friends and family um, and it never felt like something that I could do as well, even though I was uh, always appreciated it. Uh, I also have a pretty robust background in retail and sales. So when it came time to start my own business, I knew that that was gonna be a big component of it. Uh, so one day I was shopping at a big box craft store for something completely unrelated. Um, I was in the checkout line and I saw a magazine about soap making and it was like a lightning bolt went off. Um, I bought the magazine, I went home, I got on YouTube, I watched every single video about soap making that I could find. Uh, I got the supplies I needed to make my first batch and I was completely hooked. <laughs> uh, so in soap making, I really have found that creative freedom that I've been searching for for so long. Uh, so my goals for the accelerator um, were first of all, to optimize my website for search engines, um, partly due to the fact that e-commerce has become such a larger part of my business during the pandemic. Uh, in the same vein, my second goal was to start utilizing a social media planner. Uh, my third goal, uh, in 2021, I hope to make uh, wholesale accounts 50% of my re revenue. So I decided to come up with a wholesale strategy to make that happen. Uh, for my uh, search engine optimization goal, the first thing I did was install Google Analytics as well as start using Google Search Console, um, which have given me a lot of great data um, so I can learn where my customers are coming from and learn more about their habits. I also audited all of the text on my website to make it more um, optimized for search engines and added alt text to every single image on my website. Uh, so for social media planner planning, um, this uh, screenshot that you can see is a software called Planoly, which is what I decided to use. Um, and it allows me to plan my social media posts out months in advance so that they can be more strategic. Um, so I have planned all of my Instagram, Facebook, and email campaigns out through the end of the year. Uh, so for my wholesale strategy, this goal actually was originally to approach 10 new prospects, but with the holiday season rapidly approaching and most shops already pretty well stocked for the holidays, I decided to focus instead on when they'll be buying in the spring in preparation for the summer season. Uh, so to that end, I made a comprehensive list of prospects with attributes. Um, I plan to spend the months of February through approximately April 
pounding the pavement with samples, both figuratively or both literally and virtually um, as conditions allow uh, and try and get as many of those accounts as I can. Um, I've also flossed up my line sheet to look a lot more professional as well as my wholesale catalog, which are both in PDF format and can be emailed as well as handed out. Um, I've also um, created a storefront on Handshake, which is a brand new wholesale uh, platform from Shopify, which is who I use for my website and my point of sale already. So that is ready to go as soon as I am restocked in the new year. So from day one, every box of soap that I've sold has read artisan soaps made with seawater. Um, and that's really the core of my business and what sets me apart. Um, <clears throat> I really strive to put forth a luxury product, not simply a souvenir uh, for customers who really appreciate a high quality bath product that also has this sense of place. Um, through my survey, as well as speaking with customers through these past three months, um, I've learned a lot about them. I've learned that shopping small, shopping local and shopping women owned is very important to a lot of my customers. Um, I've also learned that my customers appreciate a coastal lifestyle, whether they live one or whether they aspire to this. Uh, that is a, an aesthetic that appeals to them. Uh, they have disposable income. They are mainly, although not all, women. Uh, they, have, they deeply value quality. And then the product discovery enthusiast is that person that I think we all know who loves to tell all of their friends and family about the brand new product that they discovered and that they simply have to try. Four and a half minutes. All right, so the, uh, the, <laughs> the way that I'm gonna be reaching my customers, over the past few months, I've had great success working with partnerships with bloggers and influencers um, since the pandemic started. So I'm gonna continue to, use, to utilize the networks that I've already made there uh, going forward. Over the summer, I had a really fantastic article written about me in Edible Cape Cod, which really got me a lot of exposure and business. So I'm going to continue again to be networking and to hopefully make more opportunities like that come my way. Um, strategically placed pop-ups are another way to sort of meet customers where they are without the overhead of a bricks and mortar shop and to be in multiple places at once so we can reach a much larger um, variety of customers. My plan for 2021, uh, Q1 is gonna consist largely of research and development. I wanna perfect my line with a view towards Q2, which is going to be focused largely on getting wholesale business and production for the busy summer season. Uh, Q3 is my big retail um, quarter with a lot of summer events and sales. And then at the tail end of Q3 is gonna be um, orders for wholesale for the holiday season. And then Q4 is gonna be focused pretty much on holiday and retail events. So from my revenue projections, you can see that big spike in Q3 due to the fact that I've got much larger retail as well as holiday wholesale orders coming in during that time. And as I think I mentioned before, I'm, a, I'm anticipating approximately 50-50 split between wholesale and retail. Um, so my next three to five years, um, I want to use my approximately $10,000 in net revenue from 2021 towards a larger workspace for 2022. I want to utilize that larger workspace to triple my revenue by 2024. Uh, I want to hire one or two employees to help staff fares and help with production, packing, shipping. Uh, by 2023 to, or 2024. And then in the next five years, I want to have my products stocked in retail stores all over the country. <clears throat> so one thing that I really want to push forward uh, more in my branding is that our products are actually very eco-friendly. Um, bar soap is a great plastic-free alternative to liquid soap that comes in a plastic bottle. I wanna phase out all plastic from my shipping materials as well as all of my packaging. Um, I wanna make this a much larger part of my message and my branding. And I also wanna make charitable giving to local environmental organizations a part of my business model going forward. So in my opinion, the most valuable part of my business is my brand and my brand story. Um, it's really what sells the products 
And it's the, the thing that I think is worth investing in going forward. Up until now, I've done all of my package design and branding myself, but I think I've reached the ceiling of what I can accomplish alone. Um, I've spoken with a branding professional who's given me a quote to do a logo design and overall rebrand, come up with a branding <clears throat> guidelines kit and label design for my existing boxes at a cost of $3,500. Um, once I have put all this work into making my brand perfect, I think it's important to protect it with a, with a trademark. Uh, attorney's fees and filing fees for this will come to $1,225 for a grand total of $4,725. So I just want to say a huge thank you to e for all um, Amanda and Kristen, you guys are amazing. My fantastic mentors, Jan, Jen, and Carmen, and my incredible, supportive, and absolutely unbelievable cohort um, that I'm so proud to be a part of. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, for the friends and family that are watching and have been supporting me from absolutely day one. Thank you so much for watching. All right, so let's give it up for Carol. Uh, so now we have 10 minutes of question and answers from the judges panels. And I, I realized that in judges orientation uh, with Susan and Asia, I didn't tell you how this was going to work. So essentially, when you have questions, if you will just send in the chat box, a question mark to me is a private message. And as I get the question marks, I'll kind of call on the judges in that order. And so Spiro, David, and Bob were here last night, so they know the drill. So I already have a few question marks, but um, so Spiro, if you'll kick it off. Thanks. Great job, Caroline. Thank you. Um, you made me fall in love with your company, <laughs> Good. but now you got to tell me about the product. So okay. Tell me about this, <laughs> the soap and start by telling us what your favorite soap is, whatever that is. Okay. Um, yeah, I get that question a lot and it's always hard to answer because I sort of love them all. <laughs> Um, I think actually my favorite product might be my latest collaboration um, that I've done with Chatham Kelp. Um, it's kind of a full circle for me. The first batch of soap that I ever made was made with kelp powder, because um, even before I named the business Atlantic Soap Company or knew I wanted to use seawater, I knew that a connection to the ocean was something that needed to be in this business. Um, so I've teamed up with Chatham Kelp who are kelp farmers um, and made a soap that uses their kelp in it. And it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and so I think, I think that's my favorite product. Usually my answer is whatever is my newest product is always my <laughs> favorite. Um, so that's, yeah, so that, that one is the one that's winning right now. And our next question is from David. Hi, great job. Um, Thank you. I also, I, I'm not a woman, but I also am very love bar soaps, especially cool sm small batch uh, soaps. So I will be checking out your site and looking for some. Great. Um, it sounded like from what you described, you've done some business this year, but it, you said in 2021, more R&D and, and build up. So is, is, do you see 2021 really being your launch or do you feel you've already launched? Um, that's an interesting question. So uh, as I said, I started in June 2019. So last last year, I had a summer and holiday season under my belt. And then January, February, I was kind of gearing up for my launch in 2020. And so obviously, the year didn't go the way that anyone expected. Um, so that because of that, I had to take a step back. I had to focus a lot more on my website, which wasn't something that I thought I'd be focusing on this year. Um, and it kind of made space for me to do something like e for all and kind of get back to the beginning um, and take away, you know, I'd kind of just been going, 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 going. And it, it made me step back and think about what I wanted this business to be and where I want it to go. Um, and then that's all been crystallized by the E for All program. So, um, so yeah, in a way, I thought 2020 was going to be my launch, but I think that 2021 is, is kind of 
is going to truly be my launch. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen, I guess, but I'm, that's the hope. <laughs> so. That's great. It sounds like you learned a lot through the process, which is- which I is did. I absolutely did. So just a, one, one other question while I'm, I'm here is just sure. when I, um, I saw you have the great social media calendar of all the things you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if, um, given it like in terms of trying to reach your target audience, how are you using social media? What are your, what are your posts about? What are you actually putting out there? To attract your, your actual target? Sure. Um, so I've been focused. I've found that the posts that actually get the most interaction are the posts that are about me, <laughs> um, which has been tough to, um, you know, that, that wasn't sort of what I, you know, I'm not like a big selfie person necessarily, um, but the posts that have my face in them and have some kind of, here's, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I started this, or here's how I make this soap. Um, people love to hear that stuff. And actually just yesterday, um, I partnered up with um, an outfit that normally hooks up vendors with pop-up locations and during the pandemic has been doing virtual pop-ups and they did a behind the brand collaboration with me on Instagram um, where I answered a bunch of questions for them and they put together a bunch of slides for a story and I got a you know I got a ton of really great responses to that and some sales um, so people love that kind of, they you know I'm it's just me I you know the brand is me <laughs> and so people love to hear about that and know that they're buying from a person um, and not a huge corporation so um, so that those are the posts that are the most successful so uh, you know I post about products and I post about event events and that kind of thing but those are the posts that that really um, speak to people the most fantastic thank you Thanks. And uh, the next question mark I have is from Asia. Um, yeah, nicely done. Um, Thank you. And uh, I, I'm kind of a, a soap junkie myself, so it's <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, it, it, I think it's just following up on the last question a little bit more. I, I'd like to know a little bit more about why a social media planner um, versus something else that you, some, some other type of tool or something else that you could have done with the social media, or maybe even spending some time with the brand. Um, but why the mm -hmm. social media planner? Were you looking to maybe save time? What, what was it? Yeah, um, yes, partly to save time. I do, it is very time consuming, <laughs> um, writing posts and, you know, and I found that doing it on the fly, I was um, just posting something to post something. And there wasn't, a, I didn't um, take enough time to think, what am I going to be posting next week? What am I building towards? You know, I've got this event coming up. How early should I be posting about that? Um, and so by planning it all out on a monthly basis, it gives you a much, um, it really lets you tell a story throughout the month um, about the brand, about what's happening with you. And obviously I, I throw in posts as, as things happen, um, but if I've got a structure and I know where I'm going, I can tell a much more interesting story than if I'm just kind of like, oh, I got to take a picture of something and just post it because I haven't posted in three days, you know. Um, so it's really helped me um, definitely save time because then I can kind of sit down and do that and then it's done. I'm not sort of working on it little by little um, all the time. So got you. And that was, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, can I? just jump in on another follow-up question. Uh, so do you have specific goals that you're looking for, like um, conversion on on posts? I don't know if Planoly allows you to be able to identify, you know, some posts get more engagement, but are they actually, mm -hmm. which posts are actually leading to sales? Um, that I actually, I don't know if they can tell me that. I can, through the Google Analytics, and actually Shopify has some analytics built into it too that I've you know, done a little bit more of a deep dive in in the past few weeks. Um, so I can, I can know where someone has come from <laughs> for each sale, but I have to kind of go in and look every time. Um, so I can find those things out. And I do, some, sometimes people tell me <laughs> that that's why they bought something is because they saw that post. Um, so that's, that's helpful. But um, yeah, I don't think Planoly has a like conversion rate, but I sort of have other ways that I can gauge that um, through other analytic, 
analytical tools, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. And the next question mark I have is from Bob. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so this is probably more comment than question. Um, Caroline, I was really blown away with your presentation and the way that you came through as having a tremendously strategic approach to looking at the market, the product, and the way you're selling it. Um, so my first question is, is this your first business venture? Yes. Doesn't seem like it. <laughs> Thank you. I, well, as I say, I've, I've been in sales for mm -hmm. a long time and I've sold a lot of different things and I've been, um, I've been involved with small businesses, but it's, but never my own business. So I, I have a bit of that experience, but this is my first venture. Well, um, I have to say that I'm probably not a soap aficionado. I'm the uh, Irish spring guy in the shower, you know. Um, <clears throat> so uh, your product wouldn't have a tremendous amount of appeal to me. And my uh, second question is, do you plan to branch out into any other products? Because I think with the way you look at uh, SEO, social media, and uh, the marketing things that I've seen you talk about, you would be successful in another product line as well. Um, yeah, I actually have branched out. Um, I've sort of focused on soaps for this presentation because that is the main portion of the business. Um, I've branched out into candles um, and I make something called a lotion bar, which is a solid lotion, which again is sort of a plastic free alternative to traditional lotion. Um, but I've got I, yeah, I've got a lot of other ideas <laughs> for other things that I could add. Um, a subscription service is something that I'd like to get going in 2021. Um, I've even thought about adding more bath accessories. I have a couple um, on my website right now, but sort of getting almost into like getting into like a home kind of um, realm. Um, so I, I have a lot of ideas about future products for sure um well, sounds good but the soap will be the key <laughs> good luck to you thank you all right so i just got i heard from the timer and that is time so uh let's let's give Caroline another round of applause nice show Caroline. Hey, Caroline. Hey, Caroline. Yay. Yay. so love your soap <laughs> And uh, next up, I just want to make sure Melissa isn't actually here. Melissa, are you here? Buttercup Cafe. All right. So I don't think Melissa has made it, but Allison, our second update, are, is here. So uh, Allison, while the judges are inputting uh, their feedback, give us a little update about Wash Your Shore Productions. Hey, you guys. First of all, it's, it's really... Um wonderful to see so many faces over the past year and a half I've come to know and love and really thrilled to be hearing all this. Carolyn, what an inspiration. Thank you so much for putting that together for all of us. Really wonderful. Um, my name is Allison Labrati. I am one of the founders of Wash Ashore Productions. We were part of the first cohort here on Cape Cod with the lovely Kristen Marshall and Amanda. And to this day, my heart is so filled with gratitude, the support the encouragement and the help and all of this has been really, 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 um, I, yeah, I'm overwhelmed with how much I appreciate you guys. So where we are at is kind of interesting as per usual. We are pretty close to funding the first film. Um, we're, we're about 60% there, give or take. We'll see when the financial agreements finally hit. That's been my biggest learning curve is security laws. Who knew? <laughs> I didn't. It's been gigantor in terms of figuring that side out in terms of funding out of state, et cetera. What's been interesting about this process for us is what we've come to realize is the film, because it's its own separate project and entity, becomes a separate thing other than the company itself. So what I've learned in the past three months where I'm in the process of learning is they're two separate things that correlate. And, and sort of that's the juncture we're at is looking at the production company as a whole and what that means and how that can benefit not only the company itself and the projects itself, but the community that we're trying to uplift and build this economic infrastructure for. And then the film, which is sort of the harbinger of that. 
So where we're at is in active pre-production, which means we've got the budget, we've got the lawyers, we've got some of the finance rolling in, we've got the script, we've got the location, we're beginning to pull the key players together. And at the same time, we're building up a slate of films for the production company itself and looking to fund that side of things while we're doing this. So that's my update. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Excellent. Thanks, Allie. And we do have about 90 seconds. Does anybody have any questions for what Allie's working on with this movie production company on Cape Cod? Well, I can just, I can, I can give a little more. The film itself is um, this film that we're putting together right now. We've got some wonderful people involved. We just signed an additional producer who is, is a huge asset. His name is Chris Reed. So we have Andrew Prendergast, Chris Reed. The director is Paul Hyatt. And then in that, what we're looking at doing is building additional tech here. And what that does is switch around the idea of post and green screen and it enables in a COVID world, what we can do is begin filming in places utilizing streaming so we can cut down what needs to happen after a film is shot and also enables safe locations for us to film in. And um, it just allows us to move much more quickly and produce more content. And Allie, Chris uh, wrote in the chat box, when are the auditions? Pardon me? When are the auditions? Oh, Chris, gosh. You know. Yeah, well, what we're looking at right now is if in a perfect world, we look to the producer, Andrew will fly in mid-January. Paul will be coming in around then too, which what's really great about this setup in terms of those auditions is we have the ability except for any above the line characters or casting, we are encouraged to cast locally. So when those happen, what I can do is send a message to both Kristen and Amanda and would love, love to get those tapes on a Dropbox and into the eyes of the director. Because one of the great things about what we're doing here is it cuts out a lot of the middlemen and we can really start to pull in the creative talent that exists here on Cape and build collaboratively film creatively and keep doing it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Allie. Thank you. All right. So let's move on to our second presenter. It's time for Taiki. All right. Let me go ahead and show the screen. OK, cool. Um, yeah, let me start this off. All righty. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Manny Stikey Magyar. And as many of you probably know, Big Tree makes videos for different businesses and different groups in the Cape and area. But one thing you might not know is that Big Tree has been making videos for uh, uh, 15 years. Ever since I was a young boy, I took my dad's photo camera and learned about video making and fell in love with it. So I tried to do every school project I could to be a video project. So this is a math project in 2009. Um, I, I really wanted to pursue it even further, so I decided to study it in college, um, where I got a lot of more, a lot more theoretical and hands-on training, um, and built a lot more short-form content. That's me in the top left doing a documentary on uh, playing video games straight for 60 hours, which I did not make. And then in 2015, I did a trip with a friend where we traveled from Japan to Portugal entirely without planes, uh, making 40 videos uh, spanning almost four hours. Um, but what was special about the whole trip is we wanted to create video content so people uh, could feel like they were traveling with us. So we had to shoot and edit videos within a day or so of traveling uh, to give them that sense and feeling. So it was an insane life uh, experience, but it was also an amazing work experience to be able to shoot and edit so efficiently. And it really helped me out today. And now uh, not much has changed where I still try to force video making into every part of my life. So for the last four to five years, I've been uh, on Cape Cod doing a lot of the same things, making videos, working with different people and different groups. Um, I've been using uh, unofficially the name Manx Media, which I transitioned officially this year to Big Tree. Um, and through this time, it's been amazing to make videos, but recently I got to be able to make videos for other groups and other people and other businesses. So I wasn't just making videos for myself, it was for a whole, whole different uh, entity. 
So I was able to tell their story in a new and an emotional and cinematic way. Um, and so I continue every day to try to learn and grow my skills as a video and filmmaker, um, and then bring that to the clients I have now and, and then continue just to grow more and more with it. So like I was saying, I started under Manx Media, which was kind of a, just an unofficial name and then transitioned fully into Big Tree of this year. Um, and so in the last four or five years, I've worked with a lot of different groups and a lot of different businesses. And it was hard to pin down my cu customer segment, but what I did realize it wasn't really an industry that I was working around, it was more of a personality. So it was usually a lot of innovative businesses I was working with and they need to have a couple criteria according to market research. Um, they need to have a budget to afford my services to begin with. Um, and then they need to be able to interested in expanding, whether it's physical or uh, within their brand. And then they were also interested in increasing or maintaining their digital presence. Um, and so now with COVID too, that's changed a lot as well with a lot of live events cut that people are reverting to online ways of communicating their business and specifically video. So these are kind of five stages of my operations and how I work. And the first stage is the discovery stage is where we make first contact with a client and an email and a phone call. Um, and then often we have an in-person meeting to learn about what they need and what we can provide for them. Uh, then we move into the pre-production phase, which is then we make a plan of what we want to, uh, what we have to do to make that vision happen. Uh, what kind of gear we need, how many people, where to shoot. And then the production stage ex executes that plan. Um, we shoot it all. And then in the editing, we build the video um, and then we give it to the client. Uh, right now, I'm the sole person in charge of all stages of this, uh, but I do subcontract out help for the production and editing occasionally. Uh, but in the future, I'd love to have more people involved from the step one to the end of it and dealing with more uh, client relations as well. Um, so since I've been doing this for a handful of years right now, I had the ability to track my revenue to some extent, um, but only until this year and through E4All, I, I was able to look a lot closer at the numbers I was generating. Um, also this year, I, I switched to an hourly structure, which enabled me to track the time better for uh, a lot of the projects I've been doing and also able to kind of track how many projects a year I've been able to do. Uh, and then simply for your guys' sake, I kind of broke it down into this, looking at my fixed and variable costs. Um, even with paying myself out, I, I still get about 25% of a net profit from most of the projects I do make. Um, and then looking into the future for feasibility, um, this would ideally be hopefully a 2021 look. Um, and I do break even pretty quickly in the, in the second quarter period. Um, and what's nice about my business is that most of my expenses occur during the variable stage where um, I have to rent out equipment or pay extra help for some of the projects. Um, so it's really great. So I'm really only spending a lot of money when I know money would be coming in, ideally. Um, and then looking at the time about the time I'm spending on these projects from that last side was $68,000 of potential revenue, which equals about 45 projects. And then judging from 12 to 15 hours per project equals about 608 hours. In a typical work week, I would probably take half that to do business management or just the, the normal functions of the business, leaving still about 20 hours left a week. And then in a typical work year, I get around 960 hours available for production work alone. So Four that minutes. feasibility slide was showing um, 608 hours. So, and then in my banner year in 2018, where I made the most revenue, it was only about 418 hours. So one of the biggest issues I have moving forward is needing more projects and more work to do. Um, and so my accelerator goals were really meant to address these issues by building a digital presence. So I now have a website, www.bigtreevideo.com, um, the social media, and also you can Google us. Um, I wanted to join the business communities here on the Cape. So I joined the CCYP and the Cape Cod Chamber. Um, and then I also wanted to establish a foundational mission for the, the business, um, for commercial and creative ventures for the future as well. Um, and then moving forward into the 12 month period, I wanted to um, move forward with the steps that I originally took. So now that I have the social media and the websites, I'd like to start engaging in social media ads to try to acquire more clients, uh, get more exposure, and then also have the ability to track the analytics and really understand the market even better, who's interested in video, um, and moving forward to those people in those groups. Um, I'd also like to take more engagement in the 
business groups that I did join. Uh, so it would be joining their, their events that they, ha they have and also hopefully hosting events that they have um, and taking more initiative in that part. And then also creating more partnerships with clients I currently have. So a lot of projects can be one-off projects, but making those projects more ongoing and more continual and having more content we can make for them. And then also create partnerships with other groups like website companies and marketing groups that in the past have gave me a lot of uh, work. Um, and those have led to a lot of other things to do. I'd also like to uh, branch out into other areas as well, um, including Plymouth and the South Shore area for more opportunities. So I know that video production is pretty expensive and there's like an endless amount of things you can buy. So this is kind of a short list of items that I've gathered that would, that would make me self-sufficient. Um, I currently rent out actually all of my equipment right now. Um, so not only would this help me uh, save me thousands of dollars per year on equipment rental, but it also gives me the freedom to not depend on a third party for any services that I wanna do. And specifically the camera is the foundational part of any sort of video production uh, team. So it'd be, the, it'd be probably the number one thing I would need. And this is the Sony a7S Mark III, which is the upgraded model of the model I've been using for the last four years. Um, I've never actually used this specific camera, but people have said and the reviews, reviews have said that it improves on a lot of the flaws that the other models have. Um, and the previous models were great cameras. And so ultimately, I'd love to take all this new gear and still and elevate the, the quality I've been bringing to the Cape and the business groups in the area. Um, but I also know that uh, it's not easy to always get video production services. So I'd love to be able to give a yearly video to a selected nonprofit um, who's doing a lot of good here on the Cape, but just doesn't have the ability to afford uh, these services. Um, I'd also love to become a hub for filmmaking and video creation resources here on the Cape, uh, specifically for the youth, for kids who are interested in learning more about how to make videos, how to do it commercially, how to do it creatively, whether it's going to be in the form of internships or just a resource for kids and young people to ask questions and learn about it. Because I remember being a kid, I fell in love with video making. I think to this day that it's one of the greatest things in the world. Um, and I would have loved to have something like this back when I was a youth learning about it instead of just kind of dealing with it on my own. Um, so I'd love to pay that forward for uh, the future of filmmakers here in the area. So I just wanted to thank everyone for listening to my presentation. I want to thank the judges for taking time out of their day uh, to be here. Uh, I want to thank Amanda and Kristen for putting on, the, or putting on this whole program, my cohort for being there with me, and uh, a special thanks to my mentors, Tim, Eileen, and Megan for dealing with my manic workflow. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, man. Great job. Nice job. All right. So it looks like Amanda's put Tyke's uh, website up there and I'm getting lots of question marks in from the judges, but I'm just going to take these in order. It looks like Bob got his question mark in first. So Bob, I'll take it away. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, great presentation. I really uh, like what you've been doing with the videos and um, I have a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Uh, you seem to have a good handle on your cost and hours spent, which I think is a good thing. And uh, I, I think what you really need to do is to get more projects that you've said yourself. Yeah. Have you thought about um, giving referral discounts to your existing customers? So yeah, I've actually dabbled with that in a little bit, which is why the working with partnerships with other groups really helps because even losing a couple costs up front really benefits. Um, I haven't dove into that in like a public sense about, you know, making that open for anybody to do. Um, the thing I know about it is, is that you can give um, a, an, a customer you did a video for a discount for referring a new customer and you can give that customer, that existing customer a discount on the next project that you're mm -hmm. gonna do for them. Get it? Yeah, no, I, I've thought about it in that, but never in that context. And I think that'd be super beneficial um, because like you've seen before, it's really about getting more projects, which is a priority for me at this stage. So I'm, I think that's a great idea. One of the things that I would offer to you is that I've uh, worked with a lot of small marketing agencies in my business. And a lot of them would love to do videos for you, but they don't have their own video um, production capabilities. Have you thought of lining yourself up with marketing companies as a subcontractor to do the videos? Yeah, I've been trying to, I've done it a little bit in the area here as farming, like, mostly one-off projects when they have something that needs me. Um, but I'd love to, again, push that further. So that's one of my goals moving into 2021 is to form more partnerships with those groups that basically generate a lot more work for me. Good. Well, the best of luck to you. Yeah, thank you.
And next question is from Susan. Oh, hey, nice job. So exciting. Um, okay, I have two questions. The first one's an easy one. Why big tree? So I, I did. I wrote, wrote it in my presentation earlier, but did I uh, miss my it? Name is Tyke, and uh, it it means uh, big. Oh, tree. I didn't. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, so I, I name, I'm yeah. old, and my glasses aren't working. No, so. I got a glass. I don't really. Sometimes I don't know. People really have some issues with the name, but uh, no, so I think I like it's cool. I think it's very cool. But my um. So my business question is. Uh, you spend some time in the numbers and the hours. What drives the number of hours spent producing a video? Is it the length of the video? Is it the complexity of the video? Um, and then do you end up pricing those things differently, even if you're doing it by the hour? Yeah, so I used to do it by a project-based uh, rate. Um, I switched to hourly because of that, because um, a one minute video could take twice as long as right. an hour video because of the complexity. So it's really based on complexities which is why the time, my time is the easiest way to track it. It's, we usually, we always give out budgets for, for the um, potential clients about what it would maybe cost. But so we track that. And the most uh, time consuming part is, is the shooting. It's, it's not, not the time consuming, the strenuous part, because we have to go to a location, get additional people to help with that. And even though it's only like three hours, it's still the travel and everything. And, and it's kind of hectic to do a shoot. So that's usually the most strenuous part of everything. Um, so you're sort of doing fixed fee project like you sort of every project is more of a fixed fee so every um, project has an estimate yeah so based on hours but yep. based but the complexity the one minute video uh, could cost more than the 15 minute video right and that's why we have the kind of the initial right. meetings to get an idea yep. about what it would entail to yep. determine that and then the hourly structure is meant to just kind of protect the people that work with me and myself about how much time because people want revisions on edits or they want another shoot which happened a lot in the past. Thank you. And uh, next question goes to Asia. All right, um, you were mentioning that the goal is to get more projects. I noticed, I believe 2018, you had your um, 31 projects, which was your greatest amount. Mm -hmm. What was going on then? Um, that's when I wanted to kind of kick it up uh, a lot more that year. So I actually connected with a website company um, they reached, we connected together and they had a lot more influx of work, uh, which is why, again, the partnerships is really important for me moving forward because it generates a lot of work, but that was probably the biggest uh, thing. And then in 2019, I wanted to focus more on some creative ventures. So focused a little bit less on commercial projects and then 2020 rolled around and it, uh, kind of steamrolled a lot of stuff. Gotcha. And, uh, next question is from David. Well, Asia stole one of mine because I was curious about the change in projects from 18 to 19, but we're all good there. Um, first of all, great job. Really interesting. The, the videos you showed look beautiful, by the way. Um, really impressive. Um, what I was interested in as well is you talked about the fact that it's hard to define your customer in terms of a particular customer. You, you, know, you talk about innovative uh, businesses, marketing budget, et cetera. Um, how, you know, Without that's a very broad, you know, hard description. How are you finding customers? And and if you had to narrow it and say, like, you know, if, for example, with marketing budget, they have to be a certain size, right, mm -hmm. or not? So, how are you finding customers with with this kind of a, a description? Yeah. So actually, I, I haven't really looked for customers. Most of the customers that started as a like starting in 2016, they kind of came to me, and then building off of word of mouth and the stuff I was doing, I was able to expand it a little bit further. Um, but that's my biggest issues right now is, is trying to tackle my market and really understanding uh, who's a potential client for myself. So hopefully with ads and analytics, I'll have a better idea of who's looking for video work um, and who has the budget available at this point. But it's definitely one of my biggest hurdles moving forward. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, kind of related to the numbers part, I, I know, you know, I assume 2020 was down because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big reason, but it did pick up in the summer. Yeah, so what I'm wondering is, I know you've got big plans for 2021, but you know, COVID's likely to still be with us through June. So any thoughts on how you're gonna manage things you know, through the first half of the year in order to hit your, your projections for 2021? Yeah, I mean, and kind of the, the charts roughly details it out. I'm hoping to really do a lot of that behind the scenes work um, in the first couple quarters and maintain relationships I have with current clients and maybe a couple others that are interested that come through. Um, and then hopefully once the summer rolls around or early summer rolls around, I can do a lot more work within that. And, and ideally, hopefully we're in a different stage with COVID, but yeah, it's difficult to really know. Great. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, so I'm gonna give another five to 10 seconds. Do any of the judges have an additional question? All right, so that wraps it for Taiki. Let's give it up for Taiki. Yeah! Good job, Taiki. Good job, Good job. Thank you. Excellent. So I don't see Melissa here. Melissa, pipe up if, if you're here. Um, no. So instead of an update, we're just going to take our five minute break here. So give everybody a chance to take a breather. So my phone says it's 656. So let's come back and uh, hear from Rick at 701. Uh, feel free to turn your video off and get five minutes of break. My dog came back with me and kind of hoarding my space. Nice. And uh, Spiro, are you back? All right, so Rick, whenever you're ready, kick it off. Great, let me get this screen sharing going. Oh, let's do it, Rick. <laughs> Don't know who that was. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Rick Alberg, founder of Pedal P Town. All my life, I've loved discovering the history of places and people. I grew up in a small town in New Hampshire and was fascinated by the local architecture and the people who built the town. When I discovered P-Town, a place which was a lot like my hometown, but far more accepting and cosmopolitan, I really fell in love. At the same time, I rediscovered bicycling and the wonderful effects it has on improving my mental health. Every time I get off the ferry from Boston, I'd ride directly to the beach to clear my mind. Eventually I joined the town's bicycle committee to help make bicycling even better. Combining the two is what created Pedal P Town, but it's more than just sightseeing. It's about telling stories that help visitors make a deeper connection to the magic of this town. Sorry about that. So the value proposition for Pedal P Town, and this is the only slide that I'm actually gonna read, um, our private guided tours help visitors make deep connections with the local community and create lasting memories of their time in Provincetown by tailoring tours to their interests and exploring town through stories of local art, culture, and history. And when I started Pedal P Town in 2019, it was all about bikes. Uh, but as I did my research, as I did my surveys, and even just through feedback from uh, guests and potential guests uh, during my first season, I learned that I, first I needed to add walking tours, that was obvious. But there were also other opportunities now that with, with the new COVID world um, of adding audio and virtual tours. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. So the customers who come to Provincetown are typically couples in small groups and they, are, they, they run a bit older, 63% uh, of them from my survey results were over 45. Um, and about half of those folks book within 48 hours. So there's a solid group of people who come to town, they're looking for something to do, they discover a tour and, and they book it. But the bigger opportunity is actually in the larger groups, weddings, corporate, education. Um, this, the photos on here are um, a group that came through town of uh, college students that were studying um, the history of affordable housing. I happen to have a lot of knowledge about that. Um, took them on a great tour around town. Um, they were uh, and, and was just a part of their study. So it was really, you know, an opportunity that it kind of opened my eyes to the idea of study tours. Um, there are so many layers of history. There's so much 
depth and richness um, to Provincetown stories that there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, to do education and sharing um, with larger groups of folks. So how do my customers find me and how do I reach them? Well, they find me online or they find me through word of mouth. Um, since a lot of the bookings take place in destination, once they're actually here, um, I've spent a lot of energy and time around branding. So you see Pedal Pitan all over the place. You see it on me, um, you see it on the bikes, you see it on coasters at some of the bars, you see it on rat cards, and you see, and you see my smiling um, customers uh, around town too with their Pedal Pitan water bottles. So my accelerator goals were really to uh, see what I could do to grow and establish this as more than just a hobby, to really create it as a solid business. Um, the first was to reach out to some major hotels and event planners on the Cape and see, do the introduction and see what business opportunities there might be for the group tour market. I had some great conversations, made some great introductions, um, but it was really clear that no one's willing to commit yet for 2021 um, until we see what the travel impact um, of COVID continues to be. Um, the second was to document all those back office things. Um, I hired a CPA to work on reports, uh, to track the key performance indicators and develop um, those reports to monitor the business so that I don't have to be in the weeds. I can know at a higher level what's going on. The third goal was to develop a guide training and staffing program, which started, you know, started me down this this deep path of, oh, what do I need to learn to be able to teach people? What I realize is there are people out there who already do a lot of this. Um, and one of the groups that I'm hoping to partner with uh, for the long term is the Mosquito Story Slam, which is a nonprofit based here in Provincetown that does fantastic storytelling workshops. Um, there's actually one coming up this weekend and a couple of potential tour guides for this season uh, will be participating in that along with me. Five minutes. Finally, the investor pitch for growth capital. Um, that turned into this slide deck that you're seeing tonight, but also two projects for the winter. One is fundraising through friends and family, and the second will be an Indiegogo campaign um, to do crowdsourced funding that while it'd be great to raise a lot of money, it's really about getting the word out, uh, doing a lot of PR around that as a project um, and just kind of generating some buzz. Oops, sorry about that. So feasibility and sustainability. Um, revenue, as you can see from this slide, it all happens in the summer season, right? I'm expecting this year about 1,500 guests. That's my projection. So 1,500 people coming on bike tours and walking tours. Cash flow is, has been an issue for me because of COVID. A lot of cash went out. No cash came in. Um, so I'll find myself with a bit of a gap uh, in the first quarter as I have to shell out a bunch of money to um, do all that Q1 uh, operating startup costs. Um, but if I hit the revenue goals for this season, I'll end up uh, with plenty of cash in the bank to be able to uh, resume operations uh, in 2022. So what are the products? There's obviously bike tours, right? It's Pedal P-Town, but I've been developing the walking tour side of the business um, and the opportunity there is starting to exceed the opportunity for the bike tour revenue. So I uh, expect to see a lot of revenue um, from bike tours, uh, from walking tours and small little bits as I develop uh, the new audio tours, some off-season gift opportunities, some gift boxes um, and some virtual artist studio visits, um, which is something I'm really looking forward to partnering with artists on. So in terms of organization and operation, well, year round it's me. Um, in the summer, in order to hit these uh, revenue targets, I'll need to bring on three part-time walking tour uh, guides, two bike tour guides, and a part-time bike mechanic to make sure that my little tiny fleet is up and running um, and working at the best of its ability. Um, I've implemented a whole bunch of systems to lighten the workload since it's just me kind of running, uh, kind of running the ship. Um, the back office is primarily Peak Pro, um, which is a tour operator package that does everything I need um, to do online booking scheduling and bike rental. Um, and then I have a whole laundry list of other uh, pieces of software that are helping to make this happen. So the future, um, I'd like to in 2023 in, expand into those uh, higher margin multi-day tours uh, for, the, for the kind of high-end customer that's uh, looking for a, a super unique kind of 
once in a lifetime experience. Um, I'd also like to grow or see if there's an opportunity to grow into food and booze tours focused on uh, locally produced um, uh, consumables. In 2024, I'd like to take the, what will be the retail space this year and expand that into a boutique bike shop. Um, and there are five bike shops in town right now, um, but all of them pretty much sell the same thing. So I'd like to specialize in European brands and bikes for business. Um, Provincetown is a wonderful place to, uh, to ride bikes. Everybody does. There's just a huge opportunity there to, uh, to grow that. Um, and then in 2025, consider adding new locations, looking at what the, uh, uh, what the nearby lookalike markets are and see um, if there's opportunities there. Social impact, the primary impact that I'd like to see the business make is creating uh, local uh, living wage jobs. Um, that is a, a real hard thing to do um, on the Outer Cape with the seasonal economy. Um, and my pricing reflects uh, that um, as, a, as kind of a, uh, a high-end product. Um, I'd also like to do more with nonprofits, uh, continue funding small projects that encourage bike and walking and really show visitors uh, what it means to do conservation. So the ask, um, th that cash flow gap is about $10,000. Um, what I'm looking for is some help to bridge some of that with either one, or either any of these uh, costs that will be coming up in Q1, uh, space rental startup insurance um, or the licensing for the town and the National Park Service. So my goal is to help visitors make deeper connections with the community and build lasting memories. I'd like to thank my mentors, Izzy, Nikki, and Larry for all their encouragement. Um, Amanda and Kristen and the E4All folks for their support in navigating through this program. And most of all, uh, all the members of the cohort who've been such a great source of inspiration over the past months. So thanks again. That's it for Pedal P-Town. Give it up for Rick. Thanks, Rick. Nice. Great. Great. Some water. Yeah, great. Woo. I'm seeing some question marks coming in from the judges panel. It looks like the first question is coming from Susan. Wow. <laughs> um, great job. Thank you so much. I mean, it seems like such the perfect service for P Town. So, my question was um, is there anything like the the personalized bike tour? I mean, I love your thought about on the ground memories um, tailored to somebody's interest, whether that's biking or walking, but does it exist? No, um, there are a couple of individuals who casually do some tours, um, but there really isn't anything that you can reliably book um, that's readily available. Um, so no, the only, uh, the only real tour opportunities are Arts Dune Tours, which has been around for 70 years, but they just do the seashore. They have a very canned, uh, it's a fantastic tour, but it's a, it's a one hour excursion out into the, out into the seashore um, or any of the water activities, which are kind of sailing, you know, evening type of things. Is, is that why that the focus is on the water? Do you think like that, why it hasn't been done? Because this seems like the perfect thing. For it. Everyone has said, everyone here in town has said, oh yeah, someone should do that. Um, or <laughs> we've thought about that, but we haven't quite figured out how to do it. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's something yeah. that's long overdue for Provincetown. Yeah. Cool. Very cool service and Thanks. product. And next questions from David. All right. Great job. Really interesting. Um, it, it sounds again something that could be really well accepted in, in that area, especially, but uh, and the Cape in general. Um, do you provide bikes, and people bring their own bikes? Um, in 2019, I tried both. I gave folks a discount if they wanted to ride their own bikes, um, or I. Uh, I actually, it, for that calendar year, I actually went out and I rented bikes from the bike shops in town, which was a logist, it worked, but it was a logistical nightmare. I spent a lot of time running around getting bikes. Um, so for 2022, yeah. I'll have my own, my own bike fleet um, to manage, to be able to manage that. The insurers also prefer that you provide the bikes as opposed to letting people ride their bikes. So you know the condition of the bike. Very interesting. Okay. And then what hit me, I, I, you talked about in 2023, the higher margin, the, the food and booze tours, which actually I'd sign up for now, um, and the, uh, the multi-day. Why not do that sooner? I mean, those sound really interesting, especially given P-Town's food and, and culture. 
Uh, COVID is really the answer to that question. Um, mul the multi-day tour industry around the world has collapsed um, because of all the restrictions. You need to be able to have a certain number of people on a tour um, yeah. to be able to make it feasible. Um, and food and beverage tours, almost all of the operators around the world have had to stop doing food tours because you can't go in and out of restaurants. Um, so when we can start doing that again, then that'll be, that'll be possible. Gotcha. So it could be as soon as 2022 if things get better, but you're, you're kind of planning right now for 23. Yeah. Cause I, cause I really need to sell, uh, I really need focus. to sell what I have, but, but okay. I will, as soon as there are opportunities to try new things, I'm always willing to, you know, throw something at the wall and see if people buy it and then figure out how to actually deliver it. Sounds great. And next question is from Spiro. Greg, what do you do when it rains? Um, typically if I know it's okay, if it's a bike tour and I know it's going to rain, I cancel 24 hours in advance and I give the guests the opportunity to reschedule, which they typically don't. Um, uh, so I account for that in my numbers. It's kind of like a break rate. Um, but, uh, what I've been talking to, I actually, the, the place where I start my tours from is right in front of art student tours. So I built a great relationship with those folks and they run rain or shine. Um, since I'll be doing walking tours, I'll be able to either, uh, I'll be able to offer people a walking tour as an alternative, but I'd also like to be able to offer them the dune tour as the alternative. And then, you know, I just internally deal with whatever the cost difference is. Um, just to make, because my goal is really to make sure that people have fantastic experiences, whether they end up on my tour or not. I still want them to remember how helpful Petal P Town was um, during their their Provincetown visit. So you could go on the uh, P Town umbrella tour. Yeah, <laughs> and there will be purple umbrellas for that. Perfect. And next question is from Asia. Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Um... P-Town is one of my favorite places to hang out and a bike is perfect for it. So I see a need, um, hopefully, you know, COVID dependent. Um, this, I think you've got a, a real <laughs> real niche here. Um, can I see your social impact slide again real quick? Sure. And I wanted to um, sure. know- I had to, I had to jump through that because of time. Yeah, no, no worries. If you could come back to that a little bit for me, I appreciate it. Sure. So um, primarily is creating living wage jobs, right? Jobs out here are low wage in the summertime. And this is an opportunity to create something that is really skilled. Um, the folks that I'm looking to hire are performers and artists um, and subject matter, matter specialists who really are enthusiastic and are great performer types. Um, so they need to, they need to get paid you know, well enough to be to make this worth their while. Um, the the second is supporting nonprofits with fundraising tours. The um, these would be tours that would 100%. It would be kind of it, my goal is to do it monthly over the course of the season um, and do a tour that is uh, led by one of their specialists in their you know, in whatever their field is, um, I'd be there along with them. All the revenue from that would go directly to the nonprofit. Um, and it's something that we'd try, that we'd target selling to um, board members and people who are primarily already supporters of an organization, but also to outside folks. It's gonna be a challenge with COVID because of the, the size restrictions, but it's just an opportunity to help them tell their story um, a little bit in a little different way, um, either on a walking or a bike tour. Um, so the three that I've identified and that I've talked to are the Tennessee Williams Festival, which I had already developed a tour with for, um, for this past year that we had to postpone. Um, summer of SAS, which does um, summer programming for kids uh, pretty much from the South and from urban places where it's not okay to be gay. Um, and they come here and spend the summer working and living in Provincetown, which is a phenomenal experience for them. Um, and Camp Provincetown, which is, uh, it, which is kind of a, an art and a history uh, tour of Provincetown through the ages. Uh, they, they do some phenomenal stuff with, the, um, with some galleries in town. Uh, the third is to fund small projects. You see the signs on that bike route sign. Uh, below it are some wayfinding plaques. I actually covered the cost of those for the, um, for the town to install those to help uh, encourage folks to ride and walk around town and to, uh, to really you know, know that it's easy to get around Provincetown on a bike because it doesn't really take very long to get anywhere. Um, so finding other small, small projects like that to, to help contribute to cover the costs. Um, and finally, the uh, 
really with conservation and with recycling and with the environment really doing the show, um, not just telling people. I hate to lecture people about recycling and putting their trash in the right bin. Um, so I really just try to try to give them the tools to be able to do that. So all of my uh, guests on the bike tours in the first season got a reusable water bottle and we talked a lot about you know, the pilgrims didn't stay in Provincetown because there was no fresh water available. Um, and we talk about the sole, sole source aquifer underneath uh, the Cape and uh, how critical that is kind of to sustainability of our communities um, and that water really shouldn't be, be wasted and we can't continue to pollute the oceans with, with single use plastics. So those were some of the things that I feel are really important in terms of the social impact of the business. And a question from David. Sure, I want one more just quickly to, um, as I was thinking about your business and your cash flow challenges. Um, have you thought about ways you can make money, generate cash in the off season and keep people employed? Um, I have. And the, the direction that I'm trending with that are, the, are um, developing some virtual tours. Um, and there's tons of virtual tours right now, right? And I think everyone's kind of burned out of Zoom tours, but really trying to develop some content that is pr super Provincetown specific, that's really unique. Um, and I've been talking to a couple of artists in town to do uh, artist studio tours. Um, I actually applied to Amazon's experiences um, and they loved the idea, but they wanted 50% of everything. Um, and I said, no, I don't. You know, I don't need that many customers um, and I don't want to lose that much money uh, or, or actually make that little money. So um, I have a great proposal that I sent to Amazon that I'm just going to reuse um, to try to uh, market those virtual studio tours um, on my own and give people an opportunity to actually buy art while they're, you know, on a tour. Um, the other thing is uh, really creating a province town in a box that you can get sent home. Um, that is, you know, Bear Week in a box. There is, uh, you know, the Provincetown uh, Film Festival in a box. I think as COVID is going to continue, we're still going to need to be find ways for people to experience Provincetown while they're still at home. So providing folks the opportunity to buy a, a box of treasures that gets shipped to their home and then a 45 minute or an hour online discussion, you know, tour, whatever it is that would go, that would be appropriate to go with that. Um, with that box, um, provide that as a uh, kind of as a package. So those are ideas. Um, executing those is another challenge, um, and there's a lot of costs associated with those. <laughs> so uh, there's there's always capital needs to develop anything like that. So I think I'll start with the virtual tours and uh, and then move on to um, uh, to additional things. Great. Good luck. Thank you. Nice. So that's the ten minutes. Uh, so. Nice job, Rick. Let's give Rick another round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Rick. Yay! <laughs> and that's it. Last Yay. but not least, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is it. So, uh, Rick, if you'll stop screen yeah, sharing, we'll, we'll say goodbye to everybody. Um, so thank you so much for, to the folks that are here tonight. This is the this is the close crew, the supporters, the, the judges, the mentor teams, the family members, the cohort, um, and the alums. So thank you so much for being here. Amanda. Any, any parting words here? Well, one to go. Excellent. Two nights down, one more to go. Thanks so much. Great to see you guys. Um, I'll see many of you tomorrow. Um, thanks for being here. Goodbye.